Okay, welcome back everyone. Today I'm going to be going through a new project of mine that um, I wanted to sort of show it from uh, start to finish from, um, you know, cleaning up the cats, putting them together and uh, going from there. So I'm going to try to keep this one a little bit shorter than my last ones and I'm going to dive right on in. So what I have open is a template file. Um, your company or your, you know, you may have a personal file that you use that has um, set up uh, parameters. If you don't have one, um, I might be able to provide mine once I clean up uh, specific items I have on there for certain clients, but um, eventually I'll, I'll just uh, throw a, uh, a Dropbox link for that file there. Um, but you'll open up your template file and uh, by now you should have already sort of looked through your uh, project files. Uh, in this case, we got a little school that we're going to be working on. It's not that big of a building, so that's why I figured I would um, try to run through it. There's just a few classrooms and uh, um, it's more like a daycare area. So real easy light hazard project. Um, it is wood structure though, so there will be sprinkler protection above the ceiling and I there's sort of the uh, estimate plan that I kind of did spotting some heads we had a really good uh, flow test on this one let me pull it up with a static pressure of a hundred and only dropped 10 pounds uh, with a pitot pressure of 83 so that's a really good flow test and a perfect opportunity to use extended coverage sprinkler heads for the layout. Let's go back to the plans. So that's kind of what I did here. Um, so usually, you know, if you haven't really gone in depth with the plans, you probably should. The floor um, area protection below the ceiling isn't going to be too difficult that's where we're going to be using our extended coverage heads but above the ceiling uh, we do have some pitches here that we're going to have to keep in mind um, and make sure that um, we lay those areas out correctly there is also a let's go back up what was that room in the gym area looks like sort of an elevated ceiling so we'll have to figure out how to come in up and get our branch lines up there and then in the, the side elevation of that there's another section with a uh, pitched roof there so lots of fun stuff here's the cross section detail so easy ceiling layout below but very um, unique sort of framing layout above and I did get video of the job site location that I will pull up let's see if I can manage to Let's mute that. Boom. Move it out to the side real quick. And I'm just trying to make sure to keep people out of the video. They might not want to be in the video. So there's only one quick glance at one of the field guys, but I don't think they'll mind too much. Um, so what we can see here, it's all wood structure. There's this gym area here, the framing, uh, there might be a ceiling here. I'll have to go back and look at the RCPs, but you can see the framing goes north to south or east or west, whatever that is here. And then perpendicular right next to it. So with a much lower ceiling elevation. So we'll have to keep all these features in mind as uh, we go through here. But we won't really worry about 
too much of that until we get to laying out the above ceiling sprinkler protection. So they were nice enough to provide a 3D rendering of the building. We don't have the BIM files though, so this is um, just PDFs only and uh, CAD files, but it's one of those awesome situations where, and one of the, I guess, I don't want to call it, call it a drawback, but it's uh, one of the things that comes with, uh, with being a, uh, a, a design company only, and you work with multiple clients from all sorts of, uh, uh, with multiple different companies that, that come to you. And usually by the time they, they uh, call you up, it's uh, something that needs to get turned around really quickly. And as you can see with the video that I took, if the building is built and you haven't even started design, that's a time crunch that most people are used to that work in uh, as a designer in, in this field and probably any field, but especially if, if you're a freelancer or uh, have just a, a design only company, um, it, by the time people call you, it's it's usually needs to be done. You, you'll hear the, the term, uh, they, need, they want it done yesterday. So we don't need a BIM model because the building's actually there. So if I have any issues, I can always run out to the job site and Fortunately, again, it's it's pretty close to where where I live, so not too bad. But yeah, we'll go back to this real quick. You can see that the reflected ceiling plan doesn't have any of the um, light fixtures or any of the diffuser locations. So, you know, in a perfect world, we can spot sprinklers and and go on our way and expect them to maybe work around us or or just uh, lay them out as we need them. But we also have to keep in mind that usually, in most cases, the architectural layout will supersede your sprinkler layout, despite being the the importance of our trade, um, everything still needs to look nice and aesthetic. So the light layouts and the diffuser locations usually take priority. So figuring out your maximum spacings while still remaining in the center of a sprinkler tile um, can be you know, figuring out that start point can be a little tricky, but eventually um, you just learn to sort of spot them in, in maybe not centered in, in rooms because usually there's going to be a light right in the center. So y you learn to uh, try to space them s in line, but usually away from the center of rooms or, or anything like that. But so what I did do is I reached out to the client and I asked... Um, for the lighting plans as well as the uh, HVAC plans and I did get them so these diffuser locations are going to be key to making sure we don't spot sprinklers right in those locations and as well as keeping in mind the uh, air handler units above the ceiling um, these usually get mounted on platforms that in wood structures they're going to be just plywood platforms so sometimes you end up with um, with having to protect not only above the ceiling in this area 
but above the ceiling, below the platform, and also above the uh, the platform for the wood structure um, above that. So it can get a little tricky, especially if the um, the platform is low enough to the ceiling to where you'll need to use uh, concealed space sprinklers because you might not get the full pattern discharge of a regular uh, 5.6 or whatever sprinkler you end up using up there. They usually in need a 18-inch um, um, clearance to any top of storage or anything like that for for in order for the uh, the pattern to to fully uh, provide coverage. So if you have less than 18 inches between the bottom of the platform for that unit and your ceiling, uh, for that area you'll need to um, use uh, concealed space sprinklers. So other things to keep in mind um, before you actually start your layout. Um, I always like to uh, see where everybody else thinks they're going to go and then try to figure it out from there. I didn't get in any of the uh, lighting plans, but I did get the CAD files. So as you can see though, it, working off of PDFs alone, um, it's going to be kind of hard to figure out exactly which tile that one is right there. So fortunately I got the CAD files and um, I'm going to start putting some of those together. I think I already have them open actually. Um, so here is the CAD file for the electrical. So there's where their lights are going to go. And here's the mechanical layout. So what I want is to have all of this information in one drawing. There's a number of ways to go about it. You can um, XREF the, the plans that you need into your own drawing. And a lot of times that's not uh, a bad idea. Um, and as a matter of fact, I'm going to try it on this one. Well, we're going to get a little crazy. So the cool thing too, which is what it looks like, I'm going to draw a circle at the center of this at uh, zero. A lot of times I'm going to copy this and paste it into here. A lot of times everybody uses the same insertion point regardless. So a next ref might actually work out pretty good because it looks like it's the same center point to um, on both of these. So a next ref is going to come through pretty nice and I'm not going to have to relocate any of the uh, the files and I'm going to bet that this one is the same. No, this one is not. So we might just, I think I might just bring in the RCP into the plan, into my template file and then XREF the mechanical and the electrical in the background since I really don't need those so much. Uh, I don't need all that information in there. So let's unlock this and erase these files here. And let's go into our reflected ceiling plan file. Um, there's a lot of these um, ceilings are already blocked, which is fine. I'm just going to Just go ahead and purge any unnecessary items. So I'm going to copy this into the drawing. Put it somewhere. I'm going to put it off to the side because once I XREF the uh, electrical and mechanical plans, I'm going to center this file right over it. So let's attach a DWG and let's find these plans. So you'll go to your file location where you have your background files. Just 
give me one second I'll pull them up So it was E2.0 and M1.0. Open this guy up. And right at zero, we'll say OK. So that's where zero is right there. And we're going to go ahead and bring in the M1.0 file at zero. So now we got both our mechanical and electrical overlaid. And it's going to be pretty cool because this you can just unload them and reload them as you need them, which makes it easy to kind of keep track of all that. And then what you can do as well, if you want to set up the colors differently. Go ahead and lock this background file. Let's move this out. Now this drawing isn't even in uh, Imperial, so I like for mechanical stuff to be either cyan or magenta. Let's go with cyan. All right. All right. Save this. And electrical. I don't need to show all the connections between all these lights. So I'm gonna go DL for delete layer. And it's pretty good there. Let me just double check it and make sure. See, that would have been a bad mistake. So what I can do is just isolate this and try to make quick work of erasing these connections between the um, light fixtures that I don't need to show on the drawings. It's just more confusion that you don't need. I don't think I need to show the emergency light. You know what? Let's just leave it. And again, just a reminder, these aren't, these videos aren't meant to be um, tutorials. This is uh, just me hanging out with you if you got nothing to do and me just being bored and trying to share what I do with the world. No big deal. I just hope that there might be some value to uh, how I do it. Uh, and I'm always open to uh, receiving any kind of criticism or uh, tips. Like if you think I've already wasted too much time erasing all these uh, connection points between the, the lights, you know of a quicker way, please shoot me an email at design at dogfightfire.com. All right, so we got that cleaned up there. Oh, there. I just did something very bad. Uh, what did I do? I'm going to pause the video and figure out what the heck I did. Okay, that was weird. Anyway lost my train of thought but so I'm gonna get rid of the uh, light switches as well and I'm not necessarily sure I'm gonna need these uh, letters next to the light fixtures so I'm gonna just DL those I 
think we can get rid of this text too. Well, that's looking pretty clean there. All we're worried about is the uh, fixtures in the ceiling location, so don't need to show all those wall switches or connections or anything like that. I um, think we're about ready to save this one. I can go back to our drawing, so I'm going to save this. here and usually you'll get um, notification that your XREFs changed if you want to load the latest and greatest ones. I don't believe I saved my mechanical one yet. There it goes. So now my mechanical is cyan and my fixtures instead of the green I'm gonna isolate them make them yellow and isolate and save go back to the drawing reload them now I'll go into options and change my background color now, sometimes, um, depending on the colors that are going on in, in the drawing uh, for your background, usually most designers that I know work in a black background. If you're mo more used to the uh, Revit environment, you might, uh, you might work on it uh, with a white background. Uh, sometimes, however, I will change it up just to uh, give my eyes a break. Uh, to a, I like this old, the sort of like a teal pattern, like tealish green. It reminds me of uh, the old desktop pad from uh, when I was in high school in drafting class. All the drafting tables were covered in a green pad that sort of looked like this. So sometimes just to reminisce, I'll do that. And it's got to be a color that isn't being used for it to properly work. So anyway, um, so we got our backgrounds in and now I'm going to move the RCP in and I'm going to see if a lot of times these uh, ceiling patterns won't change colors if you try it this way, but it looks like they're just hatch patterns. So maybe we'll uh, get lucky and the ceiling grid will match the light fixture locations and um, the diffuser locations. I'm going to pick my like a miscellaneous layer. I'm going to make this background a block. And I'm just going to call it RCP. I'm going to find an insertion point. Let's go to the inside of this room here. And it looks like the lights are matching up, but I'm going to go back to black. But these diffuser locations are not. So what do you do, you know? Um,
change these to urgent. So what do you do with uh, these diffuser locations? Well, the mechanical contractor is either going to move, move this diffuser to this tile or to that tile. So usually I pick whichever tile the diffuser is most in will most likely get placed in that tile. Um, if I was the installer, that's what I would do. Um, so not too worried about that, but looks like we do have a few that lined up okay. All right, so we're going to go ahead and lock this and let's lock our X ray flare. So now we just have a uh, now we just have a cleaned up background ready for us to start spotting some sprinklers. So I'm going to type in SSP. Now we know that we're going to need we're going to use extended coverage sprinklers. Still not sure of the spacing that I plan on using, but um, but usually I'll uh, stick to about 16 by 16 or 18 by 18, depending on how big the room is. We'll see how far we can try and stretch these calcs. Our remote area is going to be at this far end of the building since our riser room is over here. So uh, we're going to go with a new symbol. And lately I've been liking just a straight up black dot for my pendants. Um, hit OK. Now I'm going to go into my part selector. And I usually start off with, um, with Tyco. I'm not, you know, affiliated with them and I don't prefer them or anything like that. But I just found that they have um, a lot of uh, a lot of options, and um, a lot of their their design data is just a lot more easy for me to uh, interpret and to apply. And um, there aren't very many limitations when it comes to how you use them. So. Um, as, as long as you're using them for how they're listed. But um, I tend to just default to them and let the, if the client wants a different brand, usually they can work it out between them and their vendor and request for equivalent um, sprinklers of different manufacturers. So I just found that Tyco tends to be more of like the, the general use one. So... Um, I didn't get any kind of specifications from the client as far as um, the finishes on these sprinkler heads. So uh, for now, I'm just going to go with a recessed, uh, semi-recessed um, sprinkler. I'm going to go light. And... see we get a few options down here and these are all the available orifice sizes that you can go with uh, 11.2k we got an 8k here 5.6 or 14k so what I'm looking at here what hydrocad provides you is these uh 
part numbers as you s sort of scroll through them. Yep. It, um, and you can reference these to whatever um, you're looking at. So let's pull up the Tyco website real quick. Now all of this, um, as you go through here, it really helps if you build your product data brochure ahead of time and know which sprinklers you intend on using. Um, and that usually facilitates a lot of the, and gets rid of a lot of the guesswork. So I really like these uh, EC11, EC14s. Uh, they're for both light and ordinary hazard. Um, And here's these part numbers, the 11.2 or the 14K. I think the 11.2 might be uh, just the one that we need. 5237 is the part number for that. So we'll look for that 5237, which is this first one up here. And temperature rating, we're going to go 155, and we're going to go chrome plated. Again, I'm going to verify the finishes at the end of the project with a client, but... Um, Go ahead and select the head wrench as well. Okay. And then um, you don't. This part usually um, you don't really need to do it, but I do it anyway. Just uh, go ahead and pre-select your discussions for your sprinklers as well. Exit head selector. Now I'm going to go ahead and also choose my 3D block for it. Um, there aren't very many options, but it does give you a few uh, recess pendant, or it gives you one V27 recess pendant option for, your, for the uh, 3D model. And again, this isn't a BIM job, but I still like to uh, make a model out of the drawing just to um just so it's a lot e just you know for the auto calc and auto list features of hydra hydrocad um you need to draw your your drawing you know uh with a working model so i'm gonna go to is for insert sprinkler Going back to the uh, data, which I'm going to go ahead and save as well. And you save that into your job folder. And uh, I have like a product data folder in my in my job folder. So um, that's where I'll just save it there. And I'm just going to go ahead and start laying these uh, sprinklers out. I'm just going to place this here. The reason I pulled up this product data was to go over the uh, spacing requirements on that. So here's the product data for that sprinkler. Uh, options are 14 by 14, 16 by 16, 18 by 18, and 20 by 20. Um, and it sort of uh, it'll give you your limitations for the hazards that you're using using them to protect. So this is why I like using this product data because it really breaks down. Um, the uh, the spacing requirements and one thing to note as well is um, when you're doing these you have to calc them at their max um, at what they're rated at so 16 by 16 you would have to calculate a 256 coverage area square foot coverage area 18 by 18 um, 324 20 by 2400 etc 
So sorry about that. I was running a test on my uh, laptop and looks like everything's good. So looking at these uh, pressure requirements though and GPM requirements, our usual um, default pressure is uh, 7.2 for either 14 by 14 or 16 by 16. It jumps up to uh, 8.7 for 18 by 18 and 12.8 psi for 20 by 20. Um, and our flow rates go up as well. So 16 by 16 at 7.2 when our standard pressure requirement is just 7 um, for 15 by 15 on with regular 5.6k sprinkler. Um, and since we have pretty good pressure with the flow test and we're going to minimize the sprinklers in our remote area, if, I'm going to see if I can get this 18 by 18 to work. Um, 20 by 20 usually um, is hard to pull off. You need a very, very good flow test for that, which we do. Um, so we'll play around with it. We'll see. We'll see what works best. So what I kind of want to try to do is start at your remote area. And if I went if I was going to go 18 by 18, that means I could be nine feet off nine foot off uh, a wall. And let's uh, grab a dimension here. I wonder if. Looks like my background might be a little bit off. There we go. That might have even fixed some of these diffusers that were off a little bit. But now it looks correct. Okay. Crisis averted. So we're nine foot nine off there. So even at nine foot off uh, this wall here, we'd still need to pop another sprinkler, which uh, at that point we would be able to cover since this room isn't even that wide. We're only eight foot nine and will be centered in our uh, ceiling towel at about about five four and a half you know two standard sprinklers would work in here so Unless we were going to try to extend this um, to 20 by 20, which means we could be 10 foot off a wall. To be centered in a sprinkler tile, we would still be 10 foot 3 off of one wall. So even at the max uh, protection area for that sprinkler, we're still going to need two sprinklers in here, which defeats the purpose of going with a more expensive and higher demanding extended coverage sprinkler. So 
and you know you got a small restroom here so the your extended coverage sprinklers are going to be really mainly utilized in these large spaces here especially uh with these uh, big open areas with no walls or anything so let's go back here and see where nine foot gets us and it looks like we're just over the center of that sprinkler tile it's not letting me snap to this See if we can't fix that real quick. I'm gonna go into my block editor. I'm gonna explode these uh, ceiling hatches to make them individual items that I can pick. And since uh, it's an X ref, say. Since it's an X ref, it still won't affect it. I mean, since it's a block, it still won't affect it too much. So, save. Okay, let's see if this works now. Boom. Okay. So we're just one inch over. So if we went back one inch, that puts us at the max spacing of nine foot. off this wall or within it so if we went 18 feet over looks like 10 feet would get us into an ideal into the center of the next sprinkler of the ceiling tile so now we're at 10 feet here um, and See, I really want a color that will make that background pop here, so it's easier to see. Let's go back to that original green. And it's important to keep changing things as you move along so it's easier for you to work through and I might even uh, change this whole ceiling to a uh, sort of more dull color let's edit that block again uh, isolate the ceiling pattern and let's see Pick 32. Save changes and close. All right, so it's a little bit easier to see now. So being 10 feet apart, you know, I, I don't, it wouldn't make too much sense at this point to keep it that you know, maxed off a wall when we can have a more evenly dis uh, even distribution with the sprinklers if I move this back a few ceiling tiles. So let's move it back four feet. Now we're going to be right at 14 feet where usually um, that's the max we would go on a standard sprinkler anyway. But we'll see if we can really put these uh, extended coverage sprinklers to work in this situation. So that's nine feet right there. And that's 18 feet right there. So I don't know, it looks like that might work pretty good. P 
so you can see down here we're in these lights so we'll move these up so the next tile over let's look at there and we're gonna need another one here so So six and then down. So I got five sprinklers in there. I'm going to try something else. So how would it look if I just went standard coverage? Standard coverage, I can be seven foot six off any wall. So I could be in that ceiling tile here. And to be centered, I can go about 14 feet to the next tile. Fourteen feet clears all this, but even if we go back a couple of tiles, or just the one, one up here, and then another one down here. Move it over one. So we'll be in a diffuser here. And See how far we'll end up from here. We're still good at six feet away from that wall there. So, and that's just using standard coverage sprinklers. And even offsetting that sprinkler there to uh, avoid that diffuser, we're still we're still at five sprinklers. So at that point, you know, it's looking at that eighteen by eighteen spacing really might not benefit us too much because unless we can cut it down to only four sprinklers or something like that, which it's over 20 feet here, so we'll need two sprinklers even at 20 by 20 here regardless. And going 20 by 20 this way isn't really worth it too much because we would still need the four sprinklers. I think going standard coverage on this, since it's such a small uh, building, and then, here, let me look at this real quick. So at 20 by 20, or even 18 by 18, In this room, if we're centered in that tile. We still could get away with one sprinkler here. And then the 
to you. And then we would need maybe just one here if it could work. So we'd be using three heads here versus standard coverage. We'd probably need one, two, three, four, five. So we'd cut two sprinklers down in here. And I'll show you that layout. That's 10 feet apart there. Copy this down. 12 feet. Still 7.9 off that wall. So in this scenario, extended coverage seems to work pretty good. <coughs> now let's see what a standard layout will look like. So since this is less than uh, 15 feet, we might be able to be less than 7.6 off any wall. Ooh, we're 7.9 there. 6 foot 7. So even if we, uh, so we'd be too far off those walls there. So we would need... Another sprinkler both over here. So I'm going to move this copy over. So we'd be one, two, three, four, five sprinklers down here. Versus three. So Who knows? Let's, and you know, this is uh, stuff that you kind of want to mess around with to find the best fit for it. And you can even go one step further and see what a 20 by 20 will do for you. So going 10 feet. Yeah, I think we established that in this room that wouldn't be ideal, but what about in this one?
So centered up in that tile, we're still too far off that wall, so we would still need two sprinklers here. So I move this back again, copy it over. Ten foot would get us about right there, so we'd be thinking about that ceiling tile in there. would be three sprinklers in here at 20 by 20. Which it looks like the 18 by 18 is only three sprinklers as well. So going back to our product data, 12.8 PSI versus 8.7 for the same coverage, for the same coverage area, for the same number of sprinklers. 18 by 18 would be sort of the way to go now. I was still sort of contemplating using the um, standard coverage heads. For for these, but you know, th the extended coverage is really coming going to come in handy maybe if it works out uh, in these corridors to cover that whole length of area but it looks like um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and start laying some of these out in these areas and uh, see what works best and I'll come back and uh, we'll, we'll decide what coverage area would be best so I'll be back in a few all right so we're back it's been several hours uh, on my end and just a brief moment on yours, but um, I decided to go and use the standard spray sprinklers just because it was only going to save like four or five heads ultimately. And um, for the amount of, and you know, some rooms were going to be better off using standard sprinklers and the benefit overall of ordering uh, two different kinds of sprinklers. Hold on, let me adjust this. Ordering two different kinds of sprinklers just wasn't going to be uh, ideal. So I really want to, um, I like to keep things real easy, um, limit the amount of sprinklers that show up on the job site, and um, just keep it simple. And that usually ends up. Um, producing a very decent sort of um, install. So we went standard spacing. What I'm doing right now, uh, I already laid out all the sprinklers for light hazard throughout the area. Um, and what I'm doing right now is establishing my elevations using the top of steel tool for all of my differing uh, elevation points so when you're drawing these in um, since the roof pitches on this end here's this side I've got 1610 the dimension that I pulled from the PDF that I imported and that's about 10 foot 6 right there so what I did is here is my 10 foot 6 and up at the highest point it's 1610 and then using this tool, the top of steel tool, I think the command is T, just top, um, you establish the elevations and on whenever it's not the same elevation in the, in the plane, you unselect this and select your differing um, st uh, stop point for the higher peak. So for example, from here, we need a, a 
to define a line that goes from 10, 6 to 15, 3. So the end point is going to be 15, 3. And I just go from the end point of the steel line to the end point. So I've defined all of the sloping uh, roof pitches. Uh, all I need to do is establish this uh, elevation here. Now I can't really overlap these, so I'm going to pull it right to the inside since um, for these elevations I stop them right on the inside of the beam. So I'm going to establish the elevation on the opposite side of the beam, which would make it pretty accurate there. And the good thing is, is where these beams are located, it matches up very closely, uh, if not exactly, to where they're located on this plan. So here's this beam transition from the gym area over to, from this area here, over to the primary care area to our riser room. So, and these cross sections, I've already imported the, uh, the PDFs of the uh, floor plan in these areas. So, I'm of the framing as well. So, I know I'm going to be able to pull a dimension to get the top of uh, the roof elevation here since it's flat in the middle area right here. Here's another section of it going through there. So all of the area that is not already defined in the slope is uh, flat from what I was able to gather from the plans. And I'm going to go back and look at the movie that I recorded. So this part right here is right at this beam line right here. So there's a beam there and it turns flat. There's the beam and then it's flat right on this side. And it looks like it continues flat all the way down there with the framing just on the inside of that wall, which I believe that's what it shows right on the inside of that wall there. So it's flat all throughout here. So partially into this room. I believe I have the corridor recorded a bit further back in the video. So this is what I uh, like to do. It saves a lot of time when you go out and survey. Uh, just get basic dimensions and uh, film the rest. So there's where it's flat. Right before it transitions over. To this area. So I was standing about right here looking back this way. I found the riser in the riser room as well. So that's where we'll be connecting. It looks like we have a grooved outlet, so that'll be good. And this is the whole area where it's flat. So down this corridor flat all the way to the end into the restrooms and everything. So the elevation for that, let me get from in here, 
So let's go from an endpoint of right there to the endpoint down here. So we got 13, 7 and a half. So let's copy this and see what the bottom of our truss is. I think that's seven. Now, the project manager had some notes at the very beginning that I kind of checked out. Um, nine foot ceiling throughout, 10 feet to the bottom of wood trusses. Uh, 18 foot 2 to the bottom of wood truss, I guess that's in that high area, 17 foot ceiling. I thought I remember s remembered seeing something about an elevation there, but um, I guess it wasn't specific for this area. But there is our 10 foot ceiling there. nine foot over here and usually when a drawing is drawn in quarter inch scale and you import the PDF if you import it at a, at a scale of 48 it'll usually um, import at the proper scale if it was created if it was a PDF created directly from CAD um, and If it's in one eighth scale, you would import it at uh, 96. I used to waste a lot of time trying to figure it out, and one day it just kind of clicked, and I tried it, and it worked. So I really wish I knew that a lot sooner. So it looks like we got 13, seven and a half to the top of the structure in this area. So, and it's all flat. So what I'm going to do is go back to my top of steel command and select. 13, seven and a half. It's the same elevation throughout. Oops. I pick the defining points. And then you just draw where the structures are located. And what I like to do is actually pick the endpoints for the um, the the steel lines, and not actual not endpoints of the building. So that way, I make sure that all the points are connected for the building, and there's not that usually helps uh, the drawing not generate so many errors when you start going into your 3D views and all that. It looks like one more. All right. So I got my structure drawn and now I know where my upright sprinkler protection is going to go. I know where the beams are so I'll need protection uprights on either side of these beams here. We'll need some up above in this area so it, it almost separates these areas for you. It does look like we'll have plenty of room to um, to use standard heads above the ceiling since the ceiling itself um, is so much lower than the roof deck. So uh, as long as we avoid this, this area right here and come down far enough from the, um, the deck, we'll, we should be fine. I'm going to measure up these trusses. 
see how far apart they are because our spacing will depend on that. So one of the things I don't like about doing um, wood structure buildings is having to provide protection above the ceiling. Um, let me pull up FPA. And if we go to uh, protection areas and maximum spacing of standard and upright sprinklers for light hazard, which is what we have uh, above the ceiling, it's going to be uh, combustible since it's wood structure. Um, exposed members, uh, we're going to have those. So combustible unobstructed with exposed members three feet or more on center that's not uh, that's not our case uh, combustible unobstructed with members less than three feet on center we're limited to 130 square foot spacing so instead of uh, using a light hazard sprinkler uh, and go going maximum 225 square feet 15 by 15 spacing the framing for uh, of the roof is going to limit our protection area to 130 square feet reason being since these wood members are so close together you you're going to want sprinklers more often that way a whole bunch of them don't have to start burning before a fire sprinkler activates so it makes sense it's just uh not a lot of fun to to lay out but it is what it is and we do what we have to do so i'm gonna lay out my ceiling elevations as well i think they were nine feet throughout except for the riser room looks like it was open to structure. So I'm going to select my define drops and sprigs. Uh, it's DW is the command. And I'm going to select this nine foot computer generated ceiling. I'm going to insert that. Now I used to, I used to uh, take care of and select every single room. But I found if you just give yourself a nice big window, the program doesn't really care. Um, and what's also pretty nifty is if you if you do windows within those windows, it overwrites the overall selection. So I know that there was that 17 foot ceiling in that um, higher area. So I'm going to hit 17 feet for these four here. And hopefully that works because, yeah, so we got 20 feet there, 22, 6, so. So ceilings are established. I'm going to go ahead and select my upright sprinkler for the riser room. And I'm, I also need to redefine the original pendant that I selected for extended coverage and uh, redefine that for a standard spray pendant uh, and more than likely our sprinklers are going to be on sprigs usually in these kind of wood structures it's not very often that you get to be um, in a perfect spot right close to the deck but um, we'll see how it works out Hopefully I can find some good uh, midpoint to uh, to run the branch lines. So we're going to select on a sprig. Go to part number. Tyco. Standard. Upright. 
Light hazard, quick response, half inch, TYFRB. We'll go to that top selection there. I'm going to go 175 degrees uh, for the attic, brass, and there we go. Exit head selector. And all right. IS for insert sprinkler. And there it is. SSP again to redefine, revise the current definition of my sprinkler there. So let's go to choose part number again and do a similar process. So I go standard. They call it a pendant recessed, uh, but that's really semi recessed. Light hazard quick, half inch, TYFRB. Gonna go 155 chrome plated. Yes, pick the chrome escutcheon. We're gonna go half inch, style 10. Chrome plated, okay. Exit and okay. So now these are redefined and we can start um, laying out our upright sprinklers. And I guess I'll save that for next time since we're already running pretty long on this one. I just kind of wanted to go over a couple of the things that you know we would that I would do to get things rolling on this but I'll uh, stop this video here and then uh, start up another one that way we can separate these at about an hour apiece um, I'm tempted to just keep it going and just make one long video but uh, it usually takes YouTube um, a while to do it and uh, it would be easier I think to split them up so I'm gonna go ahead and do that now and then um, I'll upload it and then I'll keep working on the next one so I'll see you next time I'll see you on the, the next video